Our next storyteller is Vivian Crawford. And I have to say, I had the chance first to meet her this evening. And I have a feeling we're going to get to know each other better over time from this point forward. Uh, Vivian's an attorney here in Philadelphia and identifies herself as a child of the civil rights movement. She was a part of the group that marched at Girard College with Cecil B. Moore to segregate it in 1965. She is, a counsel, she is counsel for the Philadelphia National Action Network here in Philadelphia. And she is a lifelong activist, as she is self-described. And I think we're all really honored that she's also agreed to come here this evening and share her story. Vivian. Um, I uh, said earlier, when I was talking to Jody, she asked about my practice. And I said, my practice is primarily my focus is, is entertainment. So that being said, you already know where I'm headed with this. No one wants to follow and act like I am having to follow. Um, and, um, I would like to share with you something that, that I think is important. One of the reasons that I feel that we don't have, um, we don't have the kind of, of um, activism that existed before was because unfortunately, and you're going to think this is strange when I say it, we no longer have the overt racism that existed during the time that I came along and got into the movement. What, what do I mean by that? Simply that it was feasible for the civil rights movement to happen because there was a unity among people. There were people that looked at what was happening in this country to people of color and said, once this was brought to their attention, they said that there is something very wrong here. Now it's not as overt, it is hidden. Jody and I were talking about the fact that uh, the prison has become a big business now and education, that we've got a governor that decides to increase prisons and, and money to prisons and let private corporations operate prisons, but education is not really important. Well, don't, we all know that that means that they're actually manufacturing bodies to go into these prisons, and so you have a lot of communities that lost their uh, uh, industrial interests, and now the industrial interest of a town that holds a town together is what? Prisons. So it's, it's that I come to this with that backdrop because what I realized as a kid, and I will tell you how I became involved in the civil rights movement, was that um, I got a call from a friend and there was this movement, there was going to be a march in Washington, and there were going to be buses going down to Washington, and there was a very popular uh, radio personality, and, and he said, well, you just call this number, and we'll see about getting you on the bus to go to, to, the, to march on Washington. So that was the beginning, but how did that march happen? And who sponsored the buses that went from Philadelphia? The people that sponsored the buses that went from Philadelphia were the business people because they realized what the problem was. The point at which the civil rights movement got to, the, got to where they were not wanting to join with other communities is what I think caused the problem for me. Because I remember, and I'll give you some names and perhaps you will be familiar with who I'm talking about, but I remember as a kid that uh, there were stores that operated up and down what was called Columbia Avenue, 52nd Street, and there were merchants. And the merchants primarily were Jewish merchants. And so they actually uh, sponsored and they contributed money for the buses to go to Washington. So you had people like Bob Klein, who at that time owned WDAS uh, Radio. You had uh, Harold Treegoop, who was in the furniture business on Lancaster Avenue, you had a group of people who said, let's come together because this is the right thing to do. It, it's no accident that there was a, a deliberate attempt to keep black people from interacting with the Jewish people who had been their neighbors, with Catholics who had been a part of the movement. All of a sudden, these people were splintered and separated because they had different interests. And that exists to this day. So I think that in order for a movement to be successful, it has to be inclusive. And we have to get to the point that we recognize that all we are doing in fighting with each other is allowing this corporate structure to perpetuate itself. And we, we don't get anywhere. So uh, 
as I said, I uh, went to Washington, and it was interesting for me because I couldn't just believe the numbers of people that I saw there and the things that I heard. And because I was a kid, my father sort of entrusted us because Cecil was a good friend of his. So he entrusted our care to Cecil to go to this march. So I was close enough to hear things. And I will never forget Martin Luther King speaking. And he was talking about economy and things that need to ha happen with jobs. And it wasn't really getting the crowd. And I heard someone, and to this day, I think it might have been Mahalia Jackson. I'm not sure. But it was a female voice saying, Martin, tell him about the dream. Tell him about the dream. <laughs> and so that is when he launched. And that was not his prepared speech. And he launched into something about the dream, which, of course, now everybody knows that speech. Um, if there is anything that I can share with you that is of particular interest is that I don't know how, if you, any of you remember Trailways bus, mm -hmm. Trailways buses. During that time, African American people traveled on the buses. They went from point A to point B by bus. They didn't really draw, ride trains. And, and actually transporting yourself by car was rather dangerous if you were going to the south. So that uh, at the Trailways bus terminal, the only time you saw an African American person was that person was a janitor. They had a stand that sold hot dogs. There, there was nobody black selling hot dogs. There was nobody black selling tickets. There was nobody black fixing buses. All that they were were janitors. So that Cecil, who was somebody that I had this wild, I mean, I was just so enchanted with Cecil. And so Cecil said, we're, we're going to have a demonstration at Trailways. And it was right around Christmas time because remember, black people traveled by bus, and so those people that were going to be going home for the home to the south for Christmas would be traveling by bus. And what was strategic about it is that Trailways happened to be the hub for Philadelphia happened to be the hub for Trailways. So that meant that if you were connecting to go down south, your hub was here in Philadelphia. So we were out there. And it was a snowy day, and we're out there, and we're just marching, and we're singing, we shall overcome, and we're carrying our signs, and the buses are going in and out, and nobody's paying any attention to us, other than, oh, well, look at them, look at them. They're just out there marching. And so Cecil said, and if any of, any, anyone in this room knew Cecil, you would know his sense of humor and the way that he talked. And he was a former MP. He was a military police officer, so he was very authoritarian. And he said, lay down in front of them buses. Ain't none of these crackers going to run over no little kids on no land in the snow. We didn't even stop to think. OK. And we laid down in front of the buses. And that is what stopped the buses from going in and out. And that's what brought Trailways to the table to negotiate. Wow. And Greyhound said, we don't need, you don't have to do that to us. We want to we talk. So now, you can see that you have that sort of mind that says, you have to hit corporate America in their pocketbook. I'm so pleased with the occupiers. I, I, just, I just applaud them. Because the reality is, when you start hitting this, these interests in the pocketbook, that is when you get something done. And the beautiful thing about what the kids have done is that they say, well, who do we talk to? Who's the leader? Well, we don't have a leader. <laughs> OK, no, there's no one that you can compromise and bring to the table and sell us out. I think that's fabulous. So that what would I, what would I ask you to take from this? One of the things that we were taught about nonviolence, when we were out there marching and when we marched at Gerard, there were the John Birchers. I mean, I don't hear people talk about the John Birch Society anymore, but they were a very real threat. And we would be out there marching, and they would show up, and they would counter protest. And our instructions were never to make eye contact and never to speak. There was, they, they were directed to who it was that spoke for us, but they could not talk to us individually. So they, didn't, they were never able to trap us into any sort of, uh, uh, I, I don't know, semantics. And, and I think now what I would like you to take away from this is what you have is with the internet, it makes it a lot easier. Now, I, for, there's another project that I have passion for, and it's a radio project, because I maintain that the civil rights movement of the 60s could not have happened if you had not had radio. Because we are, were so all so used to tuning in to WDAS and WHAT and people like, uh, I, what was uh, Dolly's name? Did anybody remember who I'm talking Dolly Banks? Was that her? Anyway. 
if you didn't have people like that that owned those stations who realized that it was really important to allow communication to happen so that when Martin Luther King traveled, remember there's no internet. When he was traveling around from city to city, he was traveling with very limited resources. I mean, there is um, Wynne Alexander, who is affiliated, I think Bob Klein was her dad, and she has done a wonderful job on the internet of putting together some historical facts about black radio. Uh, I am involved in a project because I think we need to start to honor these pioneers from black radio who actually kept the message going. So you knew where the demonstrations were because it was on the radio and everybody was listening to the radio. And then we had fabulous music and our music began to take on the color of what was going on in the movement. So I, 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 I'd like you to take from this, you've got the internet, you've got access to communicating and tweeting and all of the various things that young people do, and that allows you to do something that Val's talking about, and that's to communicate. So you're able to do that, and I think that what you also have going for you is that you get it. It's about dollars. I, the, the only reason that people don't have the kind of freedom that you want is because it doesn't help corporate interests in this country. And so the moment that you start looking at corporate interests and saying, okay, we are prepared to reevaluate, let's restructure, let's rethink about how things happen. That's how movements happen, that's how you get passion going, because young people haven't bought in and they have not been compromised by the, 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 I don't want to say values, they've not been compromised by the materialism that happens when you get to be a certain age. And what you will find is that once you become a part of this movement, it lives in you. I cannot help myself. There is, there's always going to be a cause. There's always going to be a something else because that's who I am and that's what I do. And I, I want to, more than anything else, I'm here to sort of give you some information about how we did it. But I am so proud of you. I so much want you to understand that there are those of us who recognize that you get it. You get that as long as we buy into and as long as you buy into of the commercialism that has attacked this country, we're never going to get anywhere. But it can happen because you have, you have just let young people see what the power is. All of a sudden, people now get that they have power. So from that, I mean, I'm here to speak to you, but there's so much I have learned from you. And I'm going to be around to answer questions, and hopefully that's some information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.